It's my privilege this afternoon to be able to introduce Brother Stephen P. Waller. I have a, a deep down feeling that our paths have crossed uh, in the past. Uh, my mind does not allow me to remember, but uh, it seems like we should have if it has not. But uh, we're certainly looking forward to his lesson this uh, afternoon. Brother Waller was born in Murray, Kentucky. He's a graduate of the Mars Hill Bible School in Florence, Alabama. He also attended Freed Hardeman College and the T.B. Laramore School of Evangelism. Uh, he preached his first sermon in 1976. He was a senior in high school. He began uh, local work in 19, I said 76, didn't I? It's 66, I'm sorry. Uh, 1966, I was a senior in 76, so that uh, uh, confused me. But he started local work in 1968, uh, two years after. And he's worked with several congregations in the United States. He's preached gospel meetings, lectureships throughout the United States and also in eight foreign countries. He and his wife, uh, the former Susan Clemens of Florence, Alabama, are married. They have two great-grandchildren. They have four grandchildren, and they have two daughters. And that's about the order that it should go, I believe. You know, the grandchildren first, and then the others. You work them in when you can. But we are... Uh, uh, thankful for that blessing that he has. Uh, I'm always impressed with those who have done mission work in, in foreign fields. He and his wife worked uh, full time in Indonesia for 10 years, establishing congregations, working with uh, young Christians and strengthening them. And uh, he has been now full time with the Hartley Bridge Road Church in Macon, Georgia since February of 2009. His lesson this afternoon is uh, entitled Plow in Hope from 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 10. Brother Waller, come preach the word to us. Thank you very much. It's a privilege to be here at uh, Memphis School of Preaching this year and be a part of this lectureship. I was very surprised to receive an invitation, but very happy to, to receive it. So good to see a lot of you good preaching brethren that I've known and crossed paths with over the years. And a number of the students that uh, we have uh, helped to support from Hartley Bridge Road through the past many, many years. And we're happy to see many of the former students and current students here at this time. I was very surprised when I walked in the door a few moments ago and saw Juanita Waller, my aunt, uh, her husband, my uncle, Robert M. Waller, passed away in January. Uh, they lived at Jack's Creek near Henderson, Tennessee. He preached for the Oak Acres congregation here in Memphis, Memphis for a number of years. And uh, very surprised to see her and so glad to have my wife Susan with us today as well. want to express appreciation for the invitation, uh, for the food, the accommodations, the fellowship. It's great. Enjoy it very much. And uh, it's great to see all these little children running around. The theme of the lectureship this year, Build Your Hopes on Things Eternal, is definitely a wonderful uh, lectureship theme. And I appreciate very much hearing the lessons that I've heard thus far. It's been edifying and strengthening, and I'm glad to be able to participate in the lectureship. The Bible is filled with all kinds of analogies and figures to help man understand the important spiritual truths and principles that God would have us to know. The Lord, His prophets and preachers, often used common everyday experiences and knowledge to drive home spiritual lessons that they wanted their hearers to understand, to aid them in a better knowledge of God's plan for man, and in regard to our duties and responsibilities unto God. In 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 10, the Apostle Paul wrote, or saith he it all together for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. The Apostle Paul, in setting forth the truth in what you and I know as 1 Corinthians chapter 9, was staunchly defending his apostleship. And he spoke of the right that he and Barnabas had to eat and to drink and to 
the right to be married to a Christian wife as the other apostles, verses 4 and 5. He further discussed his right to refrain from secular work that he might receive financial consideration from congregations for the work that he did in the kingdom of God. He illustrated this with three figures. First, the soldier, he said, does not go to war and pay his own way. Second, the man who plants a vineyard has the right to eat of the fruit of the vineyard. And the third is that the shepherd who tends the flock has the right to be a partaker of the milk of the flock, verses 6 and 7. The soldier and the farmer and the shepherd must have a way of providing for their physical needs and that of their families. And this was also a part, he said, of the law of Moses, showing that God was even concerned about the welfare of the oxen that would tread out the corn, Deuteronomy 25 and verse 4. But the greater lesson was that the laborer, in this case, the preacher of the gospel, is one who is worthy of his hire. When Paul wrote 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, he exhorted Timothy to be a faithful Christian and a faithful preacher of the gospel. He speaks of various aspects of the life of the preacher and how one should consider this the most important work that one can do for the Lord. He compares the preacher to a soldier, an athlete, and a farmer. Each one has a specific work to do, and each one is to receive a monetary or material reward for his labors, for his efforts. All of this involves the idea of material or physical aspects for the support of a gospel preacher. And as we study the great context of 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we learn a lot about the importance of the preacher doing his work and brethren supporting those who proclaim the gospel of Christ. We could spend a great deal of time this afternoon, I think very profitably, talking about this in its context in regard to the support of gospel preachers. Preachers often have a difficult time when it comes to financial support. Going about to raise funds for mission work is not an easy task, and I know because I've been there. And so we know that it's often difficult to live on what we have to live on sometimes. So we could talk a lot about that this afternoon and learn a great deal about it. But I want to direct our attention to some other spiritual lessons that we may be able to gain from the text of this particular passage, and as it relates in particular to the lectureship theme, of 2017. Again, notice what he says. Or saith he it all together for our sakes, for our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. Several lessons are suggested by the phrase plow in hope. We want to examine some of these spiritual truths this afternoon. The preacher, and I'm not limiting this just to preachers. Most of us here, uh, the men are preachers of the gospel of Christ. There may be elders and Bible teachers, but preachers are not the only Christian workers. There are women who do a wonderful job in teaching the word of God to women and to children, teaching in a private situation. And so there are gospel preachers and there are other Christian workers as well to whom this lesson would apply. But I would suggest to you that those of us who preach the Word of God and who work in the kingdom of God for the sake of our Lord work as seed sowers or farmers. God has ordained that the gospel of Christ should be preached. In Mark 16, 15, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. In the text of Romans 13, rather Romans 10 beginning in verse 13, the apostle Paul says, how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. The gospel is to be proclaimed into all the world. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. The preacher and the diligent Christian laborer are very much like the farmer. The farmer plows in hope. The farmer who desires to have the harvest of the fruit or the vegetables, the grain, the cotton, whatever it is, the seed that he's planting, must first clear his land. He must prepare that land, that soil to receive the seed. And he works diligently with the land, with the soil, that he might produce the things that he needs for his livelihood. It's very important to keep in mind that he finishes planting the seed, 
in that field, and then he waits for the rain to come. The mix of the seed and the soil and the fertilizer and the rain, uh, the sunshine, all in time, if everything works as it should, will produce those first small green shoots of the plant that begin to come forth. The farmer rejoices when he sees the first, grain, first green blades come forth out of that soil, whether it's cotton or corn or beans or whatever it may be. And day by day, the farmer looks at his field and he sees those small plants as they continue to grow and as they begin to develop. He returns to the field and with his hoe, he begins to cut the weeds, the grass, the morning glory vines, all of that with the idea that he wants to help those plants to grow and develop so that they will be productive and that he and his family will be able to eat and that he might be able to provide for others who have needs. Toward the end of the season, the plants have grown, they have developed, and they may be hanging full of vegetables or fruits. He may have to go out there during the process of that season, and with some uh, vegetables, you have to go and get them when they first appear. The cucumbers, the squash, the okra, you've got to go out there and work with those every day. But he goes out and he gathers the harvest. And what a wonderful thing it is. The joy of the work is found in the gathering of the harvest at the end of the season. And the reward is twofold. The reward is that he gathers or reaps what he has sown and he always reaps more than he sows. And he rejoices when the food is prepared and on the table and ready to eat. What a joy it is to have that wonderful crop that has come in. Sowing and reaping for the farmer is a matter of life and death. And it is the life of himself and his family and others that may need his help as a result of the labor that he has put forth. One of the problems that is faced by farmers involves matters over which he has no control at all. He has no control over the weather. We often hear about farmers who lose their crops because of all kinds of terrible reasons. He may face floods, he may face hail and high winds, drought, fire. It could be other dangers that could kill or diminish his crop. And in one year, he may have a great harvest and the following year, he may have little or nothing at all because of various things that enter into the situation over which he had no control. When I was a little boy, I'd go visit my grandpa Waller in Reedland, Kentucky, near Paducah. My grandparents were faithful members of the church. My grandfather was an elder of the Clement Street congregation for many years there, and later an elder for the Reedland congregation. He had a farm. And he, all his life, was a farmer. He did other work to earn a living as well, but he was primarily a farmer. When I was a little boy, I always enjoyed following him into the field, and he plowed with a mule or a horse. And I liked to watch him as he put all the harness on the horse or the mule, and we'd take that plow and go out into the field, and I'd follow in his footsteps. And he had a long stride, and my little feet, I'd try to match every one of his footsteps going down that field. I wanted to be just like Papa Waller. And the wonderful thing about it was that you could take your shoes and socks off, and when the ground is all plowed up really nice and feel that soil between your toes, that's a lot of fun. As I grew older, he uh, let me learn how to hitch up the horse or the mule. Then he let me plow, and he taught me about the danger of looking back, because you can get in big trouble looking back when you're plowing with a horse or a mule. But I enjoyed that, and that was a learning experience. And I've had a, a theory for a long time that every young person needs to spend some time farming because they will learn a lot about life, and they will learn a lot about the importance of what our Lord sets forth in His Word when He talks about matters involving agriculture, horticulture, farming, seed sowing, and things of that nature. You know, we live in a world today where a lot of people think that uh, potatoes grow in a box. Corn uh, grows in a can, and there are some who actually believe you have to kill a cow to get the milk out of it. That's kind of strange, and it's very strange, and if a cow falls down a hill, you get a milkshake. So, I don't know, it's strange. But the preacher is a farmer in the sense as expressed by the Apostle Paul, as he compared himself and Apollos to such. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning at verse 8, he says, "'Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos?' 
but ministers by whom ye believe. Even as the Lord gave to every man, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor." Preachers and Christian workers labor in the kingdom of God. And Paul is warning us here in what he said about himself and Apollos not to get too headstrong or haughty about what we do. We need to be men of humility. He said, who is Paul? Who is Apollos? We're really nothing. We're really not that important in the whole scheme of things in one sense of the word. He said the one that really counts is God who gives the increase. We're just working on the labors of others and we're striving to do what is right in the kingdom of God. But what we do is we labor with the hope of winning souls unto Christ. You know, one may begin a work of sowing the seed in a location and establish a work there. And then a few years later, somebody else comes along and they begin to water with that work and work with it and develop it even more. And it takes time and it takes labor for both to work and to see the great result in the end. Jesus declared that his word is the seed of the kingdom when he explained the parable of the sower or the soils in Luke chapter 8 and verse 11. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. In the parable, there were four types of soil that represented the various types of the hearts of men who, re- who would receive the word. The preacher seeks to implant the word of God in the hearts of men. Some who hear the word of God are not necessarily good soil. They may be represented by what our Lord spoke of when he talked about the wayside soil, the thorny soil, the rocky soil, Luke 8, 4 through 15. And the seed produces best when it is planted in the good and honest heart. The yield in such a heart, he said, is a hundredfold, Luke 8 and verse 8. Isaiah wrote some truths that are very interesting concerning farmers. In Isaiah 28 and 24, he said, Doth the plowman plow all day to sow? Doth he open and break the clods of his ground? And the answer to those questions is yes, that's exactly what he does. That's what the preacher does. That's what the Christian worker does. But I would suggest to you today that the preacher and the Christian laborer are stewards in the kingdom of God. And as stewards, we have the responsibility and the accountability for that which has been entrusted into our hands. We seek to reap a harvest of souls. The farmer is the steward of the field and the soil, the seed, the plow, and all the other equipment that he uses in the process of his farming efforts. He must be disciplined enough to work diligently on a daily basis in his field that he might reap the harvest. He'll work on the sunny days, but he'll work on the cloudy days. He'll work on the days when rain is threatening. He will work till the work is done. He cannot just let it lie out there and nothing happen to it. Any lack of diligence on his part may cost him his crop. The gospel preacher then and the Christian worker must be a diligent proclaimer of the Word of God. In 1 Corinthians 4 and 2, Paul wrote, Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. He is to preach in all seasons, at all times, to those who will hear the gospel truth. In 2 Timothy 4, beginning in verse 1, Paul said, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick of the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall they heat to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. The preacher is the steward of his own soul. He is the steward of the time that is put into his work. He is a steward of the word of God. And in a sense, he is a steward of the souls or soils into which he is planting that word. And he cannot plant a corrupted word, a perverted word. Otherwise, salvation will not take place, but rather 
condemnation. The preacher is a steward of the true seed, 1 Peter 1, 23. Peter said, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. As a steward of the word of God, he must be a faithful proclaimer of the truth and never a compromiser of truth. He must never sow the tares, the false seed, the false doctrine, as our Lord discussed in Matthew 23, uh, Matthew 13 and 24. He must faithfully proclaim the word of God, the truth, without addition, subtraction, or substitution. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. In John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. It is this truth when obeyed from the heart that will make men free from sin, John 8, 32. Ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. It is this truth by which one is begotten or born again. James 1 and 18, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. It is this truth, the gospel, that saves the souls of those that believe. Romans 1, 16. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, unto the Jew first and also to the Greek. This is the message then that brings hope to those who respond to the gospel message in a favorable way. Colossians 1 and 5, Paul writes, For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before, in the word of the truth of the gospel. The gospel is the gospel of hope. In 1 Thessalonians 2 and 13, Paul wrote, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh in you that believe. Our effort... In preaching and teaching the word, both publicly and privately, must be done when times are favorable and when times are not. We build relationships with people so that we can help prepare their hearts to be receptive unto the gospel. We nourish friendships with sinners and saints so as to influence them in a godly way. And just as the farmer has to sharpen the blade of his plow, the preacher must sharpen his mind, his knowledge, his abilities, and he prays and studies and meditates upon the word of God and other materials that he may always be approved of the Lord. 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. In 1 Timothy 4, verses 12 and 13, and verses 15 and 16, Paul writes, let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conduct, in, char in charity, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine, Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them that thy profiting may appear unto all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. When the preacher preaches so as to rebuke sinners and to expose sin, this is very much like the farmer hoeing and chopping the weeds out of the field that he might be able to save the plants and enable the fruit to be produced. Remember, 2 Timothy 4 and 2, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. But the preacher and the Christian worker are to also be zealous in their efforts. Just as the farmer works diligently in his field from sunup unto sundown, the preacher of the word of God considers wisely the field which is the world and he must be zealous, fervent, energetic, enthusiastic, and have a positive attitude as he looks to the field from which he hopes to reap the harvest of souls. He preaches and teaches with love and compassion. Paul says that we're to speak the truth in love, Ephesians 4 and verse 15. This means that we are very reluctant to give up on a lost soul that we're teaching. Many years ago, I had the privilege of hearing on numerous occasions the late W.A. Bradfield, a wonderful, faithful preacher of the gospel. He had a great influence on me in a lot of ways. I've had a lot of preachers that have had a lot of influence on me in many ways. Brother Bradfield had his own unique way of influencing people. He was a powerful man from the pulpit. He was amazing in the ability to get responses in a public way to the invitation during gospel meetings. 
Brother Bradfield became an educator, and he also was the head of the public relations department, the recruitment department at Freed Hardeman College for a long, long time. And he taught a class in personal evangelism, which I had the privilege of being a part of. At one time in his life, Brother Bradfield was a coffee salesman. And he told us in his personal evangelism class, he said, you must never give up when it comes to seeking to save those that are lost. He said, one thing I learned, you always knock on just one more door. You try to get your foot in the door. You try to make that next sale. And if you've worked all day and if you've labored and you're worn out, you still need to knock on one more door, talk to one more person, spend just a few more minutes in speaking to somebody about what you're trying to sell. And, of course, he's talking to us about the gospel of the Lord. As we think about reaching the lost, we need to do just exactly that. Spend one more moment, ten more minutes, knock on one more door, make one more telephone call, talk to one more person because it may be that is the person that we will influence and reach with the gospel of our Lord. One of the similarities between preaching and farming is that just as the farmer cannot stop working with his crops, if he's going to have a harvest, the preacher is not to stop working for the Lord in the field of the world. Even though the farmer may not be plowing and planting in the cold of the winter, he's still planning and laboring for future seed planting. He's working in his mind of what I'm going to be doing next. He may be sharpening his plow blades and the hoe. He may be repairing other equipment. He may be planting just where and what kind of seed he's going to plant in the next season. And he may be reading and studying the old farmer's journals that he may learn a little bit more about what he does in regard to farming. The best methods of farming. Those who plow and plant must be patient and let the seed do its work. We often see the farmer as we drive down the road, he's out working in the field. We don't see as many nowadays as we used to, it seems, because everybody's selling off the farms. But we used to see that a lot. He puts the seed in the ground, he buries the seed, and even though he digs around it and fertilizes it, he has to allow the seed to do its work. It takes time for that. The planted seed, the Word of God, is preached by the preacher, received by man, and the seed has to go to work in the heart of that person's soil, their soul. Luke 8 and verse 15, the Lord talked about the good heart. He said, having heard the Word, keeps it and brings forth fruit with patience. You know, it would be very foolish, wouldn't it? For a farmer who plants his seed today in the field, he wakes up tomorrow morning, he goes out, he looks out across the field, he says, I don't see any plants out there. Where's my crop? I planted seed yesterday. Well, we know that that's not the way it works. That's not the way God designed the seed to germinate and work in such a way. You don't plant it one day and the next day you go out and you've got a full crop of corn ready to go out and pick the corn. It just is not the way it works. He has to allow the seed to do its work in the earth. And we have to allow the seed of the Word of God to do its work in the hearts of those who need to obey the gospel. Sometimes we may not see the instant results that we might like to have. You know, we're, as we all know, live in the world of instant everything, but people don't just normally instantly obey the gospel. We will work with people and we may have some who after a short while will obey the gospel of Christ. But there are some we may have to work with for years before they obey the gospel of our Lord. But the word has to have time to germinate and develop. And one thing we're not to do is to go and take the seed out of the heart of someone in whom we have planted that seed. We need to nourish the seed. We need to work with it so, and work with that soil so the right kind of fruit is brought forth. Much love and care is needed in regard to that. Let us never allow the Word of God that has been planted to be compromised by someone else and result in fruitlessness. What would you do if you were preaching in a gospel meeting somewhere and you were preaching the gospel plan of salvation, the one church, the sin of denominationalism, New Testament worship and why we do not use the mechanical instrument of music and worship. And you preached your heart out and you sit down and the local preacher gets up and says, I hope none of you were offended by what you just heard. That happened to me one time in a gospel meeting. I didn't know what to say. I nearly fell out. 
He took the word that I just preached out of the hearts of some of those people. Brethren, we don't do things like that. You let the seed do its job. Don't apologize. Don't be offended on behalf of someone else. Let the word do its work. In Jude 3, we're told to contend earnestly for the faith, not betray the faith. Let the seed, the soil, the fertilizer, the cultivating, the sun, the rain, all of that work together to produce the fruit-bearing plant, a soul that is saved and prepared for heaven. In this process, the preacher and farmer must, must be men of patience. In James 5 and 7, James said, Be patient, therefore, brethren, under the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it until he receive the early and the latter rain. Now, James is talking about the coming of the Lord, he says. But he illustrates it with the farmer who must be long patient in the work that he does. We cannot force the seed to do its job. We cannot force the salvation of souls. In the Lord's church, we are not as those who are in the Muslim faith who will tell you if you don't accept Allah, if you don't accept the Islamic belief, we're going to kill you and thus force people into that religious situation. We simply present the word, we plant it in their heart and hope that it will bring forth the fruit that the Lord wants. In Ecclesiastes 11 and verse 6, the writer said, In the morning sow thy seed. And in the evening withhold not thine hand, for thou knowest not whether shall prosper, either this or that, or whether they shall both be alike good. So he's saying, stay with it. Don't give up. Stay with it. Let God give the increase. The Bible tells us we reap what we sow. Galatians 6 and 7. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. We sow the word of God. The living word. Hebrews 4 and verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of sunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Those who in the first century heard the gospel had to develop faith in their hearts. How did they do it? Well, we know the answer very simply, Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. In Acts 2 and 37, they were convicted of their sins Bible says of those on Pentecost, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? They were convicted of sin. Not one single person in the New Testament days was saved by having the gospel forced on them. Every convert obeyed the gospel because the truth was proclaimed, the truth was planted in his or her heart. He was convicted of his own sin and responded to the gospel message and the love and the grace of our Lord. But it took a preacher of the word to plant the seed. I would suggest to you also today that there are joys, there are frustrations, and there are disappointments in our work just like there is in the work of the farmer. You know, a farmer can have a huge crop in one year, as I mentioned a moment ago. And the next year, he may lose everything he had. He doesn't know what is the outcome of that situation. Much hard work goes into the efforts to try to save souls. In fact, in Acts chapter 8, there is time for rejoicing. When Philip went down to Samaria and preached Christ unto them, the Bible says there was much joy in that city. Then in verse 39, the Bible talks about Philip as he went and taught the gospel to the Ethiopian eunuch. And the Bible says that he went on his way, the eunuch went on his way rejoicing. And Philip was found at Azotus. The Bible does not tell us the reaction that Philip had to all of that. I kind of have a feeling that he was very full of joy as well because the soul was saved. But to have a soul reject the gospel of Christ is sometimes a very harsh reality that we have to face. The multitude who heard Stephen preach the gospel did not appreciate his, soul, his seed sowing, and as a result of that, they killed him, Acts chapter 7. Some people will die before we can ever reach them, and that is one of the tragedies of the way things go in life. You know, the multitudes of millions of people around this world need the gospel. And there are not enough workers to go around to do the job, but we've got to do the best we can. I remember when we were living in Jakarta, Indonesia, Susan and I 
had a lady, a very fine lady, who was a Protestant, who was our teacher of the Indonesian language. She would come to our house every couple of days, and she became a good, close friend of ours. We had already been teaching those that were with our, of our acquaintance in that area, the gospel. Some of them were worshiping with us who worked in our home and who labored around us. We were happy to have that happen, but we really wanted to convert our speech teacher, our language teacher, to the gospel. And she'd come over. We studied with her day after day, week after week. And finally, she came from uh, northern Sumatra, and she said, I want to know if what you're telling me is the truth, and she knew it was. I want to know why your people didn't go to North Sumatra a long time ago and teach my family this. Well, that's a hard question to answer. And the only thing I could say to her was this. Her name was Muti. I said, Muti, I can't be responsible for everything everybody else does. I can't be responsible for past generations and what they may or may not have done. But you know the gospel and you need to obey it. Sadly, she never obeyed the gospel, I think, because of that very thing. She couldn't get over the fact that those in her family who had gone on had not obeyed the gospel of our Lord. Others will die having heard the gospel, but never respond in a timely manner to the gospel plan of salvation. We need to keep in mind, as we talk about sowing the seed and winning souls, the ultimate evidence of the productiveness in the life of Christian workers is indeed the salvation of a soul. In John 4, 34 and 35, Jesus said, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the field, for they are white already unto harvest. The apostles sought to win souls, Acts Five and 42. And daily in the temple and in every house they cease not to preach and teach Jesus Christ. Paul's love and joy in the brethren at Thessalonica was expressed in the expectation that he had of seeing them in heaven one day. And brethren, I think that this is the essence of, of what I'm trying to get at in talking to you about plowing and hope. In 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 19, he said, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? The thing that Paul wanted, most importantly, in addition to going to heaven himself, was to see those in Thessalonica as they were in the presence of Christ at his coming. Brethren, when we plow in hope, that's what it's really all about. We want to be in heaven. We want to be in the presence of our Lord. But we want those whom we have taught, who have obeyed the gospel, to be there with us. That is the great hope that we have. The Apostle Paul plowed in hope. He looked forward to that heavenly reward after all of the travel, after all of the preaching, after all the suffering, after being shamefully treated and reviled as the offscouring of the world, 1 Corinthians 4.13, he looked forward to the joy of standing in the presence of Christ and seeing those in all the places where he had been who had obeyed the gospel to be there with him. What a joy that would be. We've talked about and heard brethren talk about what a joyful time it is to be together like this in this location. What a greater joy it would be to be in heaven with one another. Paul wrote in Philippians 3 beginning in verse 7, What things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. And do count them but dung that I may win Christ. And be found in him not having mine own righteousness, but that which is of the law, that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. In Philippians 4, beginning at verse 11, he said, Not that I speak, speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. 
I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And then those famous words to Timothy, 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 through 8. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Brethren, let us continue plowing in hope, hope of heaven and the hope of seeing those that we have taught, enjoying the beauty and the blessings of heaven with us throughout all eternity. Thank you very much.